Eagles plucked, Dons break duck, first goals galore, and the planes finally soar. This is the Sash Women's, most definitely not the official podcast of Essendon Football Club's women's side. I'm your host for this week again, Ari, and with me is Jord. How are you going, Ari? Not too bad. How's your weekend? Yeah, pretty good, pretty good. It's always a lot better when Bombers win, obviously. Yeah. Um, no, I went around to the in-laws, did a few little jobs there, the bought a new place. No but brunches yeah. this week? No brunches this week. <laughs> no, not quite. There was an afternoon tea, we'll call it that instead. Yeah. Nice. Um, yeah, it does uh, does perk up the weekend when we have a win. Yeah, and quite nice and early on a Saturday. So you get the win under your belt and you've got all weekend yeah. to really revel in it. It's great. Yeah, it, um, yeah, it sets up the weekend nicely. And also, given we're not in the finals on the men's side, there's nothing to depress us afterwards, which, yes, is, exactly. which is good. Um, just a quick note, as we mentioned last week, we're looking for a new panellist. Um, if you look in the socials, there will be a link to put in submissions to ask, answer a few questions. Uh, so be sure to get those in if you're interested. And let's get on with the show. to square it back to Press Barkas for her first goal as a bomber. And as she so often has, secures victory. Something to celebrate for Essendon in their 150th year. The Bombers with their first AFLW win. Wales, about 45, lets it go right to the line, and it is all the way home. I'm Dari Bannister, and you're listening to The Sash. Alrighty, let's crack on with it. Essendon defeated West Coast at Fossil Fuel Field, otherwise known as Mineral Resources Park, in Perth. 6-5-41 to 3-7-25. The goals were for us Williamson, Goff, Kane, Alexander, Vott and Adams, all singles. And for uh, West Coast, Weston, Lewis and Franklin. Um, great game, I thought. Yeah, it was. It yeah. was. It's... um. You know, it, the first half in particular was really, really enjoyable to watch. Yeah, we had, um, right on top. Yeah, yeah. And we, we were dominating the inside 50s, dominating possession. Mm-hmm. It was really nice to watch. Um, after half time, slipped a little bit, but, you know, that first half was enough to just about wrap it up. Yeah, I mean, that's going to happen. Like, you know, we can't have the sort of momentum all the time, but mm. I never I never thought they were going to get back into it. No, no. Even, even when there were six points down with... What was that in the third or fourth quarter? Yeah, um, it, it it still felt comfortable. Yeah, yeah. Um, and after last week as well, with what happened with the injuries and sort of how we just lost sort of the appetite for the contest, I felt like we were really cracking in from from the first moment. Like we were just harder at the mm. ball. Still, like issues to iron out. Um, but yeah, I just felt like we were really up for it, really having a crack. Yeah, and I think that was that was echoed by. Press Parkers after the game when she was interviewed on the coverage, she said that throughout the week they'd uh, you know looked quite introspectively at how that first game went. Right. Um, so I think that they really, really did throughout the week try and mentally prepare a little better and uh, really come out firing, which they well did. Yeah, yeah. No, it was a, it was a good effort. Um, in terms of the teams, uh, as we uh, predicted a little bit last week, Georgia G was a late out, I think with calf tightness, if I remember correctly. Yeah. Um, and Adams came in for her first game. Um, but I saw after the game on socials, on Instagram, that um, Adams' parents were in Perth, so obviously she knew <laughs> pre-game that she was playing. Yeah. So, Maybe another little case of uh, cheeky injury management. Yeah, like, there's a uh, bit of that going around this week, mm-hmm. um, which we'll get to later. Um, and first goals everywhere. Yeah, yeah. Lots and lots of them. Uh, so Goff, Adams, and Williamson all kicked their first goals. Um which was great, and everyone gets around them. It's mm. yeah, and all three goals had um, a really high level of skill. Um, yeah, Goffy, great set shot from you know a reasonable distance out for a lot of AFLW players. Uh, Adams really good on her feet, cuts in front, gets the uh, the intercept mark from that. Ball yeah, in from, and we did that a lot. I felt yeah. like we were really on it. We were really sort of paying attention. I think uh, uh, Cody uh, Jax did it a few a few times as well. It seems like we were really paying attention to. We kind of knew what they were going to try with their ball movement, yeah. and we really managed to shut down their exits, which was great. Absolutely, um, and good finishing as well, which yeah. is not something we see all the time. No, particularly particularly. Um, yeah, and then Williamson's as well, which is great. Like yes. really, sort of just. Hard, yeah, who, yeah. It's Williams. It's it really come out of nowhere for me, at least. Um, 
she's someone who I thought maybe at the end of last year didn't really have a place in the future of the side. Um, and whether it be through Fortune um, that she's in the side now, I think she's taken it with both hands. Yeah. That first goal was really impressive. She's developed physically a lot since yeah. those first few games and then season one. Um, like a completely different player, really. Yeah, I mean, she was a weird one. So she, she, you know, we were speaking about Morecambe last week. Those were the two that were the late um, sort of pickups onto our list for injury replacements in season one. She got a few games in season one mm. um, as an 18-year-old and then missed the entirety of last season yep. injury uh, with injuries. And we kind of, yeah, like you said, we kind of thought that maybe she would be one of the delistings and she managed to stay on the list and obviously get fit for the start of this season, which was good. But I really liked it with yeah. her out of the square. Like they, you know, we were thinking about how they were going to spin the magnets and how we were going to cover for, for Bonnie. And it seemed like um, Daria did and, and Magic did a lot more of the lead up mm-hmm. sort of, mm-hmm. you know, running out from inside 50 to outside 50, providing an option. And then they just stuck Williamson in the square to do the sort of one-on-one yeah. bullocking stuff. Which is, it's, it's such a far cry from where she was because yeah. at least in my memory in that first season, she was a small body, obviously only 18 at the time, but was playing a sort of an outside mid winger half back, I thought from yeah. memory. Um, just a 180 complete change to a sort of big, big lumbering yeah. full forward. Yeah. I, I felt like as well, like my, again, you know, we're going off memory here a bit, but her her in our first season, I felt like she just didn't have the tank. Mm. And so she would, you know, could do a decent first half of footy, but then the second half would just have to be coming off all the time and just wasn't able to run out the game. She's And like, you know, that's understandable. She wasn't kind of a really elite pathway. You know, she played rep footy, but not not a huge amount and in, in the country. So you know, and also an 18 year old. So she needs a f- probably a few pre seasons, but now, yeah, she just looked like strong. I mean, she's yeah. like built like a brick shit house. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, she just like overpowered people with, and then showed a burst of speed as well, which was great. Yeah. And not only did she have that size and strength, but she uses it really well. Yeah. Particularly with that goal, just the smarts and now to just knock her opponent off the yeah. ball. And it's, it's easy from there. Yeah. Really like new, knew what she was trying to do yeah. and then executed it yeah. really well. It was really good to see. Um, with uh, Adams, we speculated pre-season that we may not see much of it this year. And I guess maybe if we hadn't had so many injuries and suspensions, uh, we may not have. But um, but she looked great. And um, yeah, the helmet thing was a weird one because I noticed as soon as pre, like pre-game that she, she had tape all around mm. her helmet. Mm. And I was trying to figure out at first, like, did, did it break or something? And But it was clearly... Like it was covering up yeah. a logo or something, yeah. but like, how didn't they figure that one out? Because it's a black and red helmet, so it's a new helmet for yeah. this club. And as a very money first club, I would have thought yeah. Yeah, the sponsorships would have been in line. Yeah, exactly. Both, like I was surprised. Yeah. Like surely they could have found some tip somewhere and got that logo off. But truly, whatever. <laughs> um, aside from the helmet, um, great debut. Yeah. Um, with it, obviously the goal helps, but. Her, what she was saying pre-season is that her strengths were her sort of um, doggedness and tenacity and attack yeah. on the ball, and we definitely saw all of those things um, in 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 her first game, which is r- r- massive credit to her. Yeah, like really lively, hungry, smart as well. Like mm. you could see that. Like she knows what she's supposed to be doing out there. Um, and yeah, like I always put a premium if you can finish finish your dinner. You know, yeah. that's that's what we like to see. And it wasn't like a, you know, it was probably 30, 35 on an angle, so it wasn't like dead set. Um, but, yeah, we, we really like to see that. I also really like to see when she, when she took that mark, um, Press Parkas and Bannister ran over as quickly as they possibly could, tap on the back, said, it's all right, take your time, yeah. easy, compose yourself. They knew she had it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, no, it's good stuff. Um, we got to talk about the uh, the goal that wasn't yeah. on, on a quarter time, which screwed me up because I predicted a 22-point win and it would have <laughs> been that had that goal have stood, which someone pointed out on the Discord. Um, but yeah, I couldn't figure out what was going on, neither could no. commentary. Did no. you? Uh, watching it live, no idea. Yeah. Um, watching it on replay this afternoon, still not really much of an idea. Like, I know that they've now said that they had adjudicated her to have gone off her line yeah. and played on. 
Um, but it didn't look like it that. It did not look like no. that. Yeah. We, we're not blessed with a thousand camera angles are <laughs> yeah. like we are at, you know, the home of footy Marvel Stadium. But, yeah. I mean, it didn't, it looked like she'd kick straight over the uh, the defender's head. Yeah. I mean, like, I I remember, I, like, the, the camera pans to the goal umpire as usual. And I, like, the goal umpire was definitely looking around. Mm. And I noted that they didn't wave the flag. Like, yeah. they just grabbed them and walked off. Yeah. So I was like, well, something's happened here. But I couldn't figure out who had called it because when they showed the replay, the controlling umpire, who was sort of um, maybe 40 metres out directly in front, definitely did not signal play on. No. But then the one in, there was another one in the pocket who seemed to. But like he, but wouldn't he have just had, had his arms out. Which... Yeah, and he wouldn't <laughs> have had a great like angle from no. there. No. So, yeah, it, I don't know. It was a weird one. I mean, like, thankfully, that didn't cost us the game because we'd be spewing. But, yeah, not great. Very strange. Um, apart from, yeah, not having her goal, uh, she had a great day out. Um, I think it was 27 possessions. Um, but, yeah, back to what we're used to seeing from Maddie. Um, lots of the ball in and under. Um Sort of a bit waxing with uh, George and Anne's score. And, you know, they kind of, one of them takes the lead and does mm. more of that work depending on the week. But yeah, really good performance from her. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, 27 touches, 16 kicks, three marks, three tackles, three clearances, 350 metres gained. Yeah, yeah another, another vintage Prisparkus performance. Yeah. Yeah. Um, another great performance I thought was uh, Maddie Gay, uh, who's had a belter mm. start to the season. But I mean, for me, at least, she like is a category difference to anything we've had before in the back line. She's so commanding, so hard at the ball. I have every confidence whenever she's going for the, going for a contest in the air, um, and also can just win a lot of ball. Mm. Um, we, you know, we've had good one on one defenders, um, but I, I don't think I've, we've had a tall option that can win that much footy back there. No, I, the only person I could think of is maybe Cat Phillips, but she certainly didn't have the same um, strength or contested. Yeah, not the air like that. No, yeah. no. Um, she had the same kind of uh, interceptability and and class off halfback, but Maddie Gay is in another class, yeah, another world apart. Yeah, I mean, I'm going the big early, the big early call that by the end of this season we'll consider her in the same breadth as Bonnie and Maddie as as our best three players mm. because. She's, I mean, it was like Bonnie last year. It was so, so evident so early that she was just on one and in a different class, you know, to it, to any of our other options. And also like just generally in the league and like, you know, maybe playing at Melbourne where there's a lot of great players, you know, you kind of don't get the spotlight that you mm. might get when you're sort of a bigger fish in a, in a pond full of younger players, but she just, she just looks like she's got everything. Yeah. And we, we have seen her predominantly across half back so far, but I'm sure at points this year we'll yeah. see her swung into midfield, swung forward when need be, and uh, it's going to be really, really fun to watch. Yeah, and it's just, like it's so great having that versatility because you know, depending on the mix and what we've got with injuries and whatever, knowing that you've got someone on, of that caliber that can play anywhere is just yeah. so good. Um, Fifteen intercept possessions. Yeah, she had. it's ridiculous. Yeah, that is like that's like Jordan Ridley territory. Yeah. Um, some of the downsides of game, uh, couldn't hit a target to save ourselves yet again. Yes. Yeah. The, the, the slow chip uncontested mark game isn't quite working for us as it had in the past. Um, I think our ball movement was still, it was better than last week. Obviously the wind's not taken, is taken out of it. Our handball links were a little bit cleaner. Uh, the the mainstay of our game is that chip uncontested mark game, and it hasn't really worked still. Yeah, I mean, I, I I might give them a little bit of an out this week because it was definitely obvious that they were trying to move the ball really quickly and try yeah. to sort of disrupt the Eagles getting their affairs in order behind the ball. So you know how much of that was by design because they were just trying to like let's not worry about hitting it up necessarily and just try and move the ball forward and progress um and i did like that we were doing a lot of switching which was really good to see um but just like you know i mean even that williamson goal you know she's leading up to the ball 30 meters out and it gets kicked overhead yeah. now she makes a goal out of it which is great but you know you can't kick it 
10 meters past the person. Like, yeah. yeah, we've got to be working on that kind of thing. One interesting thing to note on our disposal efficiency is that against Fremantle, it sat around 50%. Mm. Against West Coast this week, it was 54%. But that's still uh, a long, a long way from the better teams in yeah. the league. Geelong, Hawthorne. Uh, Melbourne and Brisbane, I think, are all going at sort of 65, 70. Um, so it's a, it's a long way away from that. Slightly different game plans for a lot of those teams, but it really has got to tighten up a little bit. It, yeah. Especially St. Kilda are a good side. It's going to have to be better this week. Yeah, and like, you know, you've got to wonder why it's happening because like they, they can't blame the weather this week because the weather was lovely. So, you know, I mean, I guess we'll we'll get more of a side of it in the next few games, but... You know, it's not like everyone's just suddenly become a terrible kick no. over the over summer. So um, hopefully they fix that up. Um, I thought Steph Kane had a really good game, uh, especially early, um, as opposed to a, a lot of our others uh, coming out of the back line of the midfield. I do love the ball in her hands. I think she uses it really, really well. I just wish she got more of the ball yes. because, yeah. you know, I don't think I've ever seen her, at least in an Essendon jumper, get more than like 15 possessions. But I just, I, w- I wish she got 25 every week because she's such a good user. Yeah. 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 And I just wonder, like, maybe that's something they can work on is that, um, you know, we have such great ball winners in, in Maddie and Georgia that, like, can we be working not on mix so much, but just getting the ball in the hands of our elite users? You know, when Amber yeah. Clark's back, she's another one like that. Yeah. Get it in their hands rather than you know, just kicking it or, or trying to get the clearance um, because it's a big difference. Yeah, definitely. And especially our inside 50 conversion rate hasn't been great. So if you yeah. have got the ball in a more dangerous set of hands, that is just going to go through the roof yeah. very, very quickly. Yeah, it changes the whole sort of look of the game if you're hitting targets. Um, the, <laughs> the goal from um, Sophie Alexander from Magic... Firstly, I loved it. Loved the Dacos basketball dribble. <laughs> that was brilliant. I mean, no wonder we call her magic because that was amazing. But it was like super weird. The, everyone was really quiet. The yeah. commentators had no idea what had happened. Yeah, they, they were like mesmerized by the fact that she'd tapped the ball, yeah. off, which is obviously a great skill. But Yeah, it was it, weird. Yeah, it, it, wasn't, um, it wasn't the craziest thing I'd ever seen in my entire life. But The reaction was like they thought it was a po- Like it was clearly not a point. It went through the goals. Yeah. The goal up high walked straight back towards the line, like not running across and signalling. Yeah. They should have figured it out. It was bizarre. It wasn't the first time that the rather WA-centric commentary team yeah. may have may have shown a little bit of uh, slight bias. Yeah, yeah, although on that, friend of the pod, Will Schofield, who the mm. boys had on their pod this season, I actually really enjoyed his commentary yeah. because um, I'm especially thinking about the sort of push in the back shepherding uh, free kicks that we got he explained it really really well and I think that would have got lost among the rest of the commentary team had he not been there um, I'm specifically think- I'm thinking about I think Goffey's goal came from one of those mm-hmm. and also there was one in the ruck that Steph Wales got but that it wasn't a push in the back that's not why the free kick was given it was that the player didn't get back to the ball yeah. you know that they, they sort of shepherded or, or pushed or levered the player out of the way and then never attempted to take mm. the mark mm. that like if you're going to do that you actually have to get your hands on the ball yes, yes. so like i did i did yeah that we do generally have a west uh western australia bias issue when we play over there but i thought he was really good i was, I was also uh, pleasantly surprised by he did he knew the, he knew some and players he he did understand the game itself a little bit more than I'd expect. I thought it was a bit of a case of wedging in an AFL bloke yeah. where they could, but he did actually seem to know what is. What yeah. Was yeah, yeah, which was good. I like to see that kind of thing. Mm. Um, what did you think about uh, Adams, the debutante? Um, we kind of talked about her a little bit, I guess. Um, and the inclusions this week. It's some big inclusions. Um well, I'll touch on Adams quickly. Yeah, I, th- I think she's got a, a future in the team. Certainly, yeah. um, whether she stays in the side with Amber Clark coming back next week, who knows? Or with George G coming back in next week, who knows? Um, but she, she'll definitely get more games throughout the year. I think she's yeah, yeah. got a future. The be- the best in for the week, I thought. Um, I mean, Jackie Vaught, I think, should not be dropped yeah. again. I think like she's so imposing and so damaging. I found it, I found it weird watching that she hadn't played round one. Really, yeah. like it was, it's so clear that she's of the class and of the level. That yeah, 
I think she'll definitely have to stay on the side. Yeah, you got to think that she's in our she's in our best team. Uh, the only thing I can think of is that maybe it was like a height thing that maybe they just thought we were too tall. You know, with Bonnie and and Goffy now in there and Maddie Gay now in there. You know, that maybe it was just a balance thing. Mm. But just on merit, you got to think she's in uh, she's in our best team, and she's also like she you know she's a leader. She's you know, I think she really brings the energy up as well. Yeah. Like when she kicks goals or all that kind of thing, you really see her getting around everyone. Yeah. I, I do think she's a she's a leader like that. And also incredibly versatile. So yeah. Even if she hasn't got a spot on the ground in the best 16, on the bench, yeah. you fill in wherever you want at any point. Yeah, plug and play. You can yeah. stick her anywhere. Um, uh, the other end, Williamson we've touched on, and uh, Van Loon as well came in. I thought... The defense as a whole, including her, did a great job shutting yeah. down the yeah. West Coast Tours. Um, there was that one sort of drop mark play on goal that they kicked, but apart from that, I don't really remember them taking a contested mark. Mm. Um, the question mark about whether she's injured or not, she came off late in the game, but we ha- we don't have the injury report yet. Yeah, and if it was something even remotely serious, more than a week or two, we would have seen it on the Essendon social. Yeah, or something. so they would have said something. Knock, corky, yeah. maybe a week out, maybe a rest. Yeah, who knows? Yeah. So we'll see. We'll see about that, and see also who's who's fit to come in because I think Scotty might be fit this week as well. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's one to look out for. Um, but we've also got uh, our uh, Korean representative. Who's going to? Who has uh, sent a voice note in for us this week to let us know what she thought of the game? So let's hear from Court. Hello, my friends. It's so good to hear your voices, and it's very weird to hear an all boys podcast. But I spent the day at Everland, which is the biggest uh, theme park in Korea. I made it out of North Korea alive, thank God. I did actually get about seventy meters. I went down into one of the tunnels. Um, I think it's the third tunnel. So basically they, North Korea over the years since the um, the, uh, DMZ was formed, they've been like um, trying to build, not build, trying to dig tunnels underneath um, to try and get into South Korea. And pretty much every time South Korea has found out that they've been doing that and stopped them, and now one of them is a tourist destination, which is very funny. So I went down there and that takes you about 70 metres away from like actual North Korean territory, which is crazy. But now I'm back in Myeongdong. Um, went to, yeah, went to Evelyn today, went on the tallest wooden roller coaster in the world. Um, it's called... T Express, I think. Look it up. It's crazy. It was, I felt like I was going to fall out of it about three times, which was just intense. Um, And now I'm about to go into a Daiso that's about 12 stories high um, and just look at everything that's a dollar. But great win over uh, in the West over the weekend. Again, I haven't watched it. I'm going to try and find a way to watch it um, maybe tonight because I'm exhausted. And, yeah, looking forward to seeing how we, we're going to keep going. Um, I think we can really keep pushing the charge and um, keep developing out our players and just see how they go. So um, another week here. I won't be home in time for the pod next week, so you're going to have to do a third week without me. I'm so sorry, um, but you guys are killing it. And I'm really excited to find another person to come in and be part of our family uh, here at the Sash Women. So good luck and I will see you when I see you up the plains. Thanks for that, Court. So funny. When Before she left, we were making jokes about her and the DMZ in North Korea. And it actually feels like she's doing a lot of, a lot of <laughs> yeah. DMZ tourism over there. <laughs> I'd be more worried about the world's biggest shitty wooden roller coaster. Yeah. <laughs> the TNC, to be honest. <laughs> yeah, she's, do- she's doing she's doing the most over there. She Absolutely. said it was like eighty five percent humidity, which sounds absolutely filthy, mm. and I want nothing to do with it. I won't be complaining about the wind on Windy Hill. This yeah. Time. <laughs> um, no, but she sounds like she's having a great time. Uh, she's like she said, she's going to be gone for another week. So it is the Jordan Ari show once again next week. But uh, then we should see Court back after that, which would be great. 
Uh, let's have a look at the coaches' votes. Uh, we got Matty P with 10, Matty Gay with 8, Shelling for West Coast with 5, George Nan score on 4, Kane 2, and Weston for West Coast 1. So the coaches thought uh, Matty P and Matty Gay were the best two on the ground, and then a bit of a mix and mash after that. Mm. I think that reflects the game. I think that those two were. I think the most impactful yeah. by some distance. Yeah, and then you know, there were, I think we had a lot of good players. Mm. Um, there were a couple of West Coast players I thought played well, but it wasn't an even performance from them, so no. I can kind of understand that. Um, as last week, we're lucky enough to have a bunch of interviews for you to all li- to listen to from Dan, who went to Essendon Media Day preseason, and this week she's spoken to our co-captain Steph Kane. So let's hear from them now. You're listening to The Sash. Um, I'm joined by Steph Kane from The Bombers. Um, how did you first up um, kind of assess your season last year and I guess the fortunes of the team more broadly? Uh, I think individually for me it was obviously just a bit disappointing. Um, I got concussed in that Eagles game, which was kind of midway through our season and then tore my hamstring at training so it was cut short and obviously didn't get to play um, our first final which was um, I just sucked individually but from a whole team perspective I think I was just really proud of our growth Um, we're getting grittier in the contest when we're playing footy and trying to really work through what our game plan looks like Um, so that was really pleasing and obviously to make finals in our second year was a great result Um, and it, it sets us up really well for coming into our third season of AFLW as well. Yeah, great. Um, and we were thrilled to see that um, you've re-signed as well. Um, how do you feel about where things are heading for the team? You know, you made finals last year, as you mentioned. Yeah, no, nah, it's super exciting. Like, obviously, to have that security as a player, but to, to know that there's a, a core group signing on as well, um, it gives you a lot of confidence that you can really... I guess delve into more detail with those players that are um, are looking to to move this club forward, um, which is really exciting. And yeah, like to have you know young kids like um, Steph Wales signing on, and some more some people that have been in the system for long periods of time, like Maddie Presparkis and mm-hmm. Sophie Vanderhuvel, who still got so much growth in their game, um, and they're the next next generation of this football club. It's really exciting to see what what the future of our our club look like looks like. Yeah, fantastic. And look, I know there's so much time in between seasons and you mentioned some of the injury struggles last year. How are you feeling? Um, how do you kind of stay motivated during that long period of time? Yeah, for me, body's feeling good. So um, you're always obviously managing niggles and stuff, but um, being able to get um, some nice consistency in my preseason under my belt, which I feel like I haven't had um, in, in a number of years now, which is really exciting. Um, the off season can be an absolute slog um, at times. We've probably spent for the most part of since the start of the season reconnecting as a group whether that's um we had one day a week that would come into the club um, and a lot of people bought into that or there was uh weekend times as well time slots as well that we were reconnecting back at the club um obviously we had quite a few of our list uh go back to play vflw as well Mm. to get some more game experience um in their belt um so i think those little challenges keep you motivated but at the end of the day um you're probably always set on coming back to pre-season day one, which was which was June 3rd, and then um, round one of our season, which is, um, it, it can linger that motivation in terms of how long you have to wait. But I think as professional athletes, we're always just striving to get better and that's what keeps us motivated. Yeah, fantastic. And um, you talked about experience there. You've played over 60 AFLW games now, which is great. Um, I'd love to hear how you've seen the competition progress. Like what's it like training and playing AFLW now compared to yeah, when the competition kind of first began. Yeah, it's it's crazy and sometimes I think nearly every couple of weeks I always take a step back and kind of put myself as an external point of view to see how far the game has come. You know, when I first started, we didn't have change rooms. We hardly even had a toilet. We didn't have some, yeah, we didn't have someone to would change. We were changing in a, a the, the men's players lounge back at Fremantle. Um, and we we're essentially on the outer in terms of trying to share club facilities um, to now what the game is and to our growth. Like we've got our own, uh, at Essendon, we've got our own home ground at Windy Hill and we've mm. been able to create a fortress there and, and really have a sense of um, home there, which is which is so exciting. And then coming into the football club, you know, we've got full, full, full rain um, on, facility, on the facilities and we've got our own, you know, change rooms and everything like that, which is, so that perspective in terms of, um, 
the facilities and, and what we have access to now as professional athletes is is fantastic. Um, from from a game growth perspective, it's it's changed a lot. Um, I, I know you'd probably go back and watch a game from 2017, and mm-hmm. you'd probably be surprised at what what the standard was back then. And um, I think for the ability now, particularly with our 12 month contracts, uh, players are starting to see there's a real access to development in the in their playing careers um and able to see that there's there's somewhere that they can consistently get to obviously the staff that we have are, are so have so much pride in wanting us to develop as athletes as well which is really exciting um but yeah the, the game has has massively grown and i just think it will continue to grow as well um there's players that are played from Oz kick all the way through um which we now get to see the benefits of um unlike me who had to kind of trade sports and really pick up footy later in life. Um, and I think that's been a massive positive out of the growth of the game as well. Yeah, great. Onwards and upwards. Um, I see that round one will see the Bombers face your old side Fremantle at home at Windy Hill. Um, it's the second time the two sides have faced off. Um, how did it kind of feel last time? Um, and does that add anything to the game for you? Yeah, it was, it was pretty funny, obviously, because I know still a, a number of the the team and and all of the I guess the coaching staff as well. Um, so it was it was funny. It was cool that like great that they had to come to to our home ground and, and play us. Um, and th- they were the ones that felt a bit out of their comfort zone. But um, yeah, on the field it was um, probably all of my good mates trying to rip into me a little bit, which was <laughs> funny. And um, a couple of comments, which you know is, is a part and parcel of footy. Um, but yeah, I think it it definitely adds another different aspect to the football game but at the end of the day you still want to win and it doesn't matter what team you're playing mm. you just want to win that game of footy so um yeah really excited to to verse them straight up in in round one um and it'll be a good challenge but yeah we'll get the win yeah great and um just finally windy hill it means a lot to the fans what's it what's it been like playing there yeah it's, it's been it's been unreal i think the way that um the club have embraced getting back there and we've really embraced what Windy Hill is to to Essendon people as well. Um, I've met a number of people in the last couple of years that have, have told us that they're coming to Windy Hill because they used to watch football games there mm-hmm. when they were young and now they get to reconnect with the ground and what Essendon is. And I think that's really exciting because they're reconnecting with the football club through a different act, as, aspect that isn't the um, men's football, but they're still coming down and supporting Essendon. So um, I think that fills your, fills your cup up a lot. Um, and yeah, being able to, like I said previously, go to Windy Hill and create it, create our own little um, den, I guess, in a sense, and a, a space of home for us is, um, it's unmatched really, the home ground advantage um, <clears throat> in that perspective. And when the, the, um, the stand is absolutely f- full, it feels like there's, you know, 10,000 people there, just the noise that they create. So it's, it's really exciting. Yeah, I love that. Can't wait to be there. Thanks for your time, Steph, and looking forward to seeing you out there in round one. No worries. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks for that. Dan, so good to hear from her again. Great interview there with uh, co-captain Steph Kane. Um, interesting stuff that that they discussed there. I completely forgot about her concussion last season. That like she was yeah. out for weeks um, and missed the finals, which is yeah, it's got that would have been so tough for her. Yeah, no, what could have been if she was there too? Yeah, uh, like it did feel a little bit. I do remember that. Like it just felt that things just went off the cliff a little bit. Yeah, like we lost her we should have been playing a home final and we didn't get to in the end. Um, so yeah, we were unlucky and particularly for her who's, you know, been an ever present. I think that was the first time she'd missed a game for us mm. was when she got that concussion. Um, and it was a, yeah, it was a really tough one. I remember watching it wasn't quite Amber Clark territory, but yeah, it just wasn't a great one. You never like to see our leaders go down. Um, but yeah, um, like they discussed, she re-signed with us this year, two more years, which is fantastic. It did sound like for her, you know, seeing a lot of our young talent re-signing, committing to the club really was the clincher for her mm. that sort of showed that everyone's got faith in where they're going. Yeah, yeah. Like the youth re-signing is a massive positive I think another good indicator of where the club's going is that Natalie Wood re-signed yeah. for an extra couple of years as well. I think yeah, that definitely. would also definitely cement in the players' brains that, you know, we're going forward, this is what was happening, and uh, we're going to continue to see this through. Yeah, that, that they're on the right path and everyone's mm. everyone's buying in, which is great. Um, I, I had no idea she played another sport before footy, and I'd love to know what that is. I've always had a suspicion that she was a soccer player because I feel like the number 20 is a cur nod. Yeah, because it's true. 
I could be making this up completely, but I I have the vague recollection of something on socials in season one, and it was something to do with that. That's why she chose the number. Um, so yeah, maybe she was a, a soccer player or a na- native West Australian herself, obviously. Yeah, of course, uh, Fremantle uh, people. Um, but we won't hold that against her. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, I could be making that up, or it could be true. But she definitely said she switched to footy, so she played something else. Um, and just yeah, we hear it from from everyone we've spoken to, and you know, um, Wushka last year, and and Bonnie, that Windy Hill is a big part of this team's mm. identity. Mm. Um, they love what it brings to them from the fans and the atmosphere and everything, but also that it really feels like they've taken ownership of it and it feels like it's their ground yeah. specifically for so, them. Something to call their own, something that they can uh, sort of build their identity around, grow with. Yeah. Um, as this team goes through, you know, its lifespan year by year by year, the crowd's going to get bigger at Windy Hill. Yeah. It'll be more intense. Um, I think so I think that relationship's only going to benefit both. Yeah, definitely. Continue. And it's feel, and it's sort of like a unique situation that it's a place with so much history behind it, but also not something that has had any relevancy mm. in the modern day for 20 years. Yeah, you know, yeah. so it's not like th- the men play there as well and they're playing there. It, it's like this wasn't a place where we played top level footy until the women's team came yeah, yeah. and it's their ground but it still has all this rich history behind it and the rooms and everything so yeah. it's like a really unique thing for them uh which is great and yeah it sort of shows everyone you know how important it is to get down to the games because they they really feel it down there um so let's look ahead to round three back at windy hill uh against st kilda it's uh this Sunday at 3.05 p.m., back to a normal time slot for us. Yeah, not quite the 4.40 that we're very used to yeah. down at Marvel. But. Yeah, I don't mind the late afternoon at Windy Hill. Uh, not so much at Marvel, but yeah, I do. <laughs> I don't know. I like uh, Maybe it really doesn't matter the time. I do love going to Windy Hill. Yeah. I love it after the game. It's just a completely different mm. sensation to leaving Marvel where, you know, it's yeah. always like depressing that it's like... Such a different experience. Yeah. Like, Win or loss coming out of Marvel, you're still like, oh fuck, I've got to, you know, shoulder to shoulder across the bridge and stand yeah. waiting for a Cranbourne and train like, for an hour and forty five yeah, minutes. and you're walking over train lines yeah. and like you feel like you're in some industrial hellscape. Yeah, whereas getting out of Windy Hill, you know, you feel like you're right in it. You yeah. know, it's great, absolutely. And everyone's in their Essendon and scarves walking everywhere. It's fantastic. Um, but so the Saints are a weird one. I don't know what to make of St Kilda this year. They've two wins from two, um, coming off a sixteen point win over Sydney. Um, at Moorabbin, but yeah, like I don't know. They were I don't I can't exactly remember where they finished last year. I feel like it was twelve ish. Yeah, they didn't make finals. They finished the season in ninth. Ninth. Yeah. Oh, okay, so um, higher than I thought. Yeah, level on games with this, just a few percentage lower. Um, right. Lower than Sydney and Essendon, who finished on twenty four. Yeah, in, uh, but I don't ninth. feel like they were ever a shot of making finals. So maybe it was like a late run, but yeah. they strung some wins together. Yeah. But um. But yeah, the two from two, two good wins as well mm. um, from them. But yeah, I don't think anyone had them as being like massive improvers this year. I don't think anyone thought they were going to be getting worse, but um, a bit of a surprise. But, you know, who knows this early in the season. Well, they have, they've also beaten two teams that people thought would rise yeah. quite significantly in Sydney and it was Gold Coast week one, was it not? Yeah, yeah. but Gold Coast are looking a bit iffy. They are looking iffy, yeah. Yeah, I guess we'll get a good sense this week when we play them. Uh, we had a great win over them last year at Windy Hill, which I think may have been our first game at Windy Hill. I think it was, yeah. 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 Um, which was, yeah, it was definitely our first game at Windy Hill because, yeah, it was like, I remember talking about, we were talking about how important it was to start winning yes. at that ground from yeah. the off, uh, which we did, which was great. Um, and the one thing that really worries me was the weather was shocking at Moorabbin this week mm-hmm. and they towered up Sydney. And then we played in the sun and I put my money on it's not going to be in the sun at Windy Hill on Sunday. Now, the weather at Moorabbin looked even worse than Windy the yeah. week before. Like, I mean, that uh, Wardlaw took that shot 10 metres out in front. Um, yeah, and did the full Jake Carla. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's, it's gone further sideways than yeah. forwards. It was absolutely... 
disgusting out there, as you can imagine. Yeah, yeah, it didn't look great. The, the um, Ferris wheel was not uh, yeah, well, in operation. <laughs> yeah, don't, yeah. <laughs> Luckily. <laughs> uh, speaking of Wardlaw, uh, she's always a threat. In season one, where she was at, um, in our season one, I mean, uh, when she was at Brisbane, she towed us up completely. And we were really worried about her going into this game last year, and we blanketed her, and she really didn't, didn't have an impact. But she was great this week. So uh, she's always one to watch out for because she's so tall. Who do, you, who do you think takes her? If if Gamble and Van Loon both play, who who do you think takes her? I th- I think I think Gamble, just because of height. Yep. Because she is so tall. Like Gamble will still be giving up height to her, but she Gamble's taller than Van Loon. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Um, so probably if she stays close to goal, I'd stick Gamble on her, and then maybe if she's wandering around a bit, Van Loon. But yep. um, because she can move up the ground. Um, so I guess we'll have to see if Van Loon gets up for the game or not. Um, as for other players to look out for, uh, Lambert is their kind of Matty Presbarkas, George and Scorn in an under ball winner. Um, always racks up the possessions. Uh, I don't think we've really got a tagger in our group. So, you know, I don't know if we'd, if we'd even consider doing something like that if we had the player. I don't know if you think... if. Uh, yeah, there's no one, you know, there's no Brent Delidio on the side. There's no one who's a tag a week in, week out. Yeah. Um, best bet, I would, if I was going to do it, I'd probably go with Kane. Yeah. Um, got the tank, got the size and strength to really annoy an opponent at stoppage. Yeah. I just don't know if you want to give up someone that uses no, the ball yeah, that well. Yeah, exactly right. Like, But like someone like, uh, even like Jackie Vogt could do that kind of thing. That's true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah that is true. I mean, there are there are options if we go there. I just think like it's it, it's one of those you know if you're playing against Adelaide or someone like that where they've got like three or four plays that are going to get you know twenty five mm. possessions. Is there a point tagging one of them, especially mm. you know? But it, when you're playing against a team where they don't have bulk ball winners, they've got like really one, and then yep. the rest will get nineteen, eighteen. Yeah, it, it can be worth it. So I guess we'll see what Nat Wood decides to do there. Um, what other players do you... Um, I'm really intrigued. St. Kilda have got two really, really strong wings in Molly McDonald and Grace Kelly. Mm. Um, they're tasked with a lot in that side. Their roles are really, really uh, important to how they function. They they get a lot of intercepts between them. I think they had five or six each against, right. um, against Sydney, as well as having 400 metres gained and yeah. 18 possessions each. Um, it's like crucial cogs in their ball movement. Exactly, yeah. exactly. They both had a few inside 50s and three score involvement, involvements yeah. each. So they really are not only winning ball you know, around that half 50, uh, defensive half 50, but also doing damage going forward yeah. as well. So it's going to be a big a big test for probably Emma Kearney, I guess, would line up on one of those wings. Yeah. Um, I mean, yeah, d- it depends if Clarkie comes back, I guess. Yeah, that's true. That could be Clark. I do like Clark on the wing. They were obviously going to use her forward, but if Paige Scott comes back, yeah, um, yeah, I don't know. I feel like every week with us, it's like it could go so many different ways yeah. depending on the personnel. Woodsy might be really thrilled with how Williamson and Adams went and says, Clarky, yeah. they'll sit down forward. You come back to what you were doing last year on that. On that yeah, one. I mean, I was even thinking um, when I was watching the game on the weekend that I, I – I wouldn't even mind seeing Clark playing like halfback flank. Like yeah. I, I think we do, especially with Bush not there, who yeah. we still don't know anything about what the story is there. But like uh, another user coming off the back line, especially yeah. a quick one. Yeah. I like Sophie van der Heuvel. I think she does that really well. But you know, we could do with another one probably. I like that. Yeah. Yeah, and she's someone that can play kind of anywhere. Um, so let's go into that team changes. We we expect we don't have, again we don't have the injury uh, list yet. Uh, Clarkie will be out of concussion protocols by the weekend, so she um, she could play if she's come up well from that concussion. Um, George G was obviously laid out with uh, calf tightness. If that's uh, better, she should be back. We don't know what the story is with uh, Van Loon's injury, mm-hmm. uh, whether that was serious or not. Gamble is back from suspension and will be available. Um, we assume Gamble's going to come straight back in. Yeah, yeah. The the only one of those mentioned that I don't think is an absolute certainty to come back in is maybe Georgia G. Um, she hasn't, particularly in that first round and the back end of last year, wasn't as influential as she had been, mm. um, particularly at Carlton. But in that first year at Essendon as well, she was such an important part. 
I think that her role is up for grabs, particularly in against Fremantle. She was getting center um, center bounce time, yeah, um, and not not impacting as much as other players could doing that doing yeah. that same thing. So maybe she's looking over her shoulder a little bit. But. Yeah, I don't disagree with any of that. I will say though, she gets picked every single week. Yes, yeah, and she and like you said, she hasn't always been, you know, giving serving up the goods, mm. and she still gets picked every week. So That's Nat true. Wood seems to absolutely love her. So, yeah, I think yeah. probably if fit, she gets selected. But, yeah, we've got no idea if she's even fit or not. Um, what about predictions? What do we reckon? Uh, goal kicker on this week, all singles. So mm. there was no goal kicker, leading goal kicker this week. Um, I might be really boring and say it's going to be a similar story to uh, the game just gone. I think there might be four or five individual goal yeah. scorers. Um, because Bannister obviously got uh, the the higher ranking defender against West Coast, yeah. and she will probably against um, against the Saints. So her, she might be cataloged a little bit. Um, apart from that, I mean, yeah, it was it was a really good instances of just players popping up yeah. all the time against West Coast, which is lots of different kinds of goals as well. Yeah, yeah. which is a, a a good sign of a nicely functioning forward line if if everyone's getting on the end of it. Yeah, definitely. I'm going to go with Lily Rose. I nice. just think, uh, yeah, I really enjoyed her work out of the goal square. I assume they're going to go with that again because it worked really well. She's a tough matchup as well. Like, she's not she's not very tall, but has got that strength. So it is kind of a do you, do you put a mid sized defender on or do yeah. you have to go almost key defender it's, it's yeah and also if they do go key defender it leaves magic you know yeah. free daria yeah. potentially so yeah i think it, i think she works really well down there for all sorts of reasons and i think i can't see her spending any time in the forward line other than out of the square yeah so i feel like she's going to be closest to goal yeah. basically all the time That's um true. if she's playing down there um best on i'm going maddie gay yeah, that's I just a good, lo- loving a good call. It yeah. Um I will go I think I think Kenny. Yeah, I, yeah. I'm going to back her in. It's going to be a tough task. She'll uh, need to have a great game. She will. Yeah, on the wings. yeah. And if if she comes away having um f- halved that uh, half that contest with her opponent whether it be McDonald or Kelly, I would I would take that as a massive win. Yeah, I am interested to see more of uh, her this season because I do think she is a really good user of the ball, um, which is one of the things we're really lacking through that part of the ground. So um, hopefully we, she gets more of the ball because I, I do like it in her, in her hands. Um, result and margin. Um, well, after last week, which was a confidence uh inspiring result because it it went almost exactly how we both thought it would go. Um I'm going to say Essendon by 14 points. I love it. I love it. Um I'm I'm a little bit worried about it to be honest. Um I'll go I'll go with a very unconfident three point win. <laughs> okay. Tight one. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I do get I do get it, but I feel like I feel like we should be winning this game we if should. we want we to should. be making finals. Yes. You know, they have started the season really well, but the you know, despite that, they're not like a crazy dangerous team no. that, you know, yeah. should be really troubling us if we play well. So yeah. hopefully we get uh, the job done. Um Let's look around the grounds. What else is going on? I do want to talk about the Chloe Malloy thing because this was bizarre. Um, for anyone that wasn't following what happened, uh, Chloe Malloy, former Collingwood, now Sydney uh, star co-captain, I think, as well now this year, um, pulled out of the game with knee soreness on uh, on Sunday, travelled down to Melbourne with the team, um, and it turns out, that at halfway through the game, the club announced that she'd done her ACL. And then subsequently it came out that <clears throat> they knew from Sunday morning that she had done her ACL. Mm. And uh, I think uh, it was, I can't remember who it was. Some journalist knew, basically, and had put the question to the club pre-game, like, has she done her ACL? And they said, no, she hasn't. Wow. And they knew at that point that she had. 
Um, and then they announced at mid-game, Chloe, the teammates didn't know. That's ostensibly why they didn't say anything because they she didn't want her teammates to sort of get freaked out pre-game by that news. But I'll tell you where I stand and then you can tell me if I'm crazy or not. <laughs> Gladly. You're crazy, Ari. <laughs> That's it. We're done. Um, how I think... I. I don't think a club is under – I don't think they need to sort of give up everything as soon as they know it. You know, I don't think, like, the scan comes in and they have to call up the media and say, a player's out. But I think if they're, if they're asked the straight question, has this player done her ACL and they know that she has, I, I don't feel comfortable with them just saying a flat lie. It's like, no, she hasn't, when when they know definitely that she has. I think, like, I mean, there's all sorts of integrity stuff about betting, which I'm not really concerned about, but yeah. it's just, like, I mean, even stuff like fantasy and stuff, like, you know, but it's, you're actually lying about what's what's going on. It's mm. not just a, we're not telling you guys yet when yeah. no one knows. It is a, it's a little deceitful, isn't it? Um, so, run me through it again. So, the players didn't know at all. The Sydney Swans players didn't know that she had done her ACL. They thought they thought she she had she was injured okay. with like knee soreness. That's why they knew she wasn't going to play. And they pulled her out of the game, game day. So the, I think that internally they knew because she didn't injure it on the Sunday. Obviously, yeah, yeah. she injured it some days earlier. So they knew she wasn't going to play. The teammates knew she wasn't going to play. Oh, okay. The teammates did know. Okay, okay. but they didn't know it. It was an ACL, which on. On by that morning, the club had learned that it was an ACL. Yeah, um, and then rather than telling the players when they knew that pre-game, M- Chloe Malloy sort of insisted that they don't tell the teammates, so that their preparation for the game wasn't disrupted. Mm, that's interesting. Like, and therefore, when they were asked by journalists, they lied because otherwise the teammates would have found out. So I- that's why they did it. I don't really. I'm not that worried that they've lied to the general public about the ACL. Like I don't really care. I find it really weird though that they would have lied to the pl- other play, like the playing group. Um, well, I'm I'm not sure you can consider it a lie because they just didn't say, like. <coughs> you know, they would have told yeah. her. They would have told the team the truth that that they knew when they knew it, which is that she's not going to play because she's got a sore knee. And then I'm not sure mm-hmm. if any teammates would have like asked. On Sunday morning or Sunday afternoon pre-game, is it an ACL? Because why would they even think that? Yeah. So they just didn't inform them once they knew. Yeah, I, I would. I would feel a little bit deceived by the club if I was a player. I think. I mean, it doesn't really affect a whole lot. But I, if if I was playing, I would want to know if my co-captain was had done her ACL or not. Yeah, but I think uh, like given it was Malloy's decision, like it was her. You know, it's their captain making... It's not like it's the club, you know, pulling strings behind the scenes, you know, and keeping stuff from them. It's like it's she's the one that's made that decision. That's fair. And, I mean, she's obviously got... um, She's got the right to do with her medical records what she wants, I guess, and her medical information. Like, I, I just, yeah, I but I don't think... I, like, I mean, that's that can't be the case because it's not like it's not like you can just hide from the the general public journalists, whatever, yeah. the truth about your injuries all the time. Like, that, that's why we have injury lists. Like, they can't just say, you know, that's why everyone got, got up in arms about the whole drugs thing, about, like, hamstring in quotation marks, <laughs> and it was really a failed drugs test because it's like, you're lying. Like, you can't knowingly lie about that. It's mm-hmm. okay to sort of, you know, if you don't know yet or if you're not, you know, whatever. But, like, people knew I can't remember, it's ex-Hawks player who now works for Channel 7. Um, I can't remember her name. Kate, 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 Uh, something. Anyway. McCarthy. Kate McCarthy. McCarthy. She's the one who knew. So she'd heard from somewhere and she asked the question. And she knew. Like, it wasn't like a, she's heard a a little whisper. Like, she knew that she'd done her ACL. And then they just boldly lied to her. But I just like, I, I think it, Maybe you can defend it in this scenario for all sorts of reasons. I think it sends like a really bad precedent that, you know, you, you can't just make up stories about <coughs> players' injuries. Mm. It is a weird one. Yeah. I'd, I don't know. I don't yeah. know. 
Anyway. Well, I, will, I will happily call you crazy again. Yeah, we'll, we'll have to get Court's opinion on it uh, when she gets back because I'm sure she'll have she'll have a, a thought on the whole thing. Um, but I don't expect her in, in Korea to be down with all of that yet. Um, as to some other uh, results, GWS on the receiving end of a belting this week after Dishy won out last week. Mm. They're, who knows what they are this year, um, completely up and down. But this seems like... Uh, what GWS do, which is that they can put in a good result and then a terrible. Yeah, I mean, I'm not, I'm not convinced. I don't, I don't think there'll be a top six side. No, I think they're more likely to be a bottom six side. Yeah, uh, but Gold Coast did the shock, I think, yeah. because Gold Coast people thought they'll yeah. kick on this year. Yeah, well, I certainly had them pegged for that. Yeah, yeah. Um, and for some of the um, more top end teams, Geelong and North uh, drew, which mm. was. Um, unexpected um i watched the end of that game and it was a weird one because obviously scores scores were level for like a, a couple of time, minutes yeah. yeah and it was weird i i had no confidence that anyone was going to score in the last three minutes of that game it just felt like one of those games where no one's going to get it within 30 meters of goal like it was just ping pong backwards and forwards from 150 to the other um yeah, it was it was quite a interesting end of the game, but I feel like Geelong. Are, I feel like we're like almost twins, and it's not a Prasparkas thing. <laughs> it's just like I feel like we're so similar in that we can produce really really good results against good teams, um, and then the next week lose a really bizarre one mm. to a much worse team. You know that like, not that we're inconsistent, but that we can turn it on and then completely lose it entirely. Like, there is such a good result to get a draw against North yeah, oh, away. Yeah, yeah you know, absolutely. Yeah, North is such a good side. There there won't be many teams at all to better that result against, yeah. against North Melbourne. Um, another, one, another one I thought was interesting from the weekend was the Carlton Gold Coast. Neither team are particularly exciting. Um, yeah. But... The the last two minutes of that game were were pretty phenomenal. Yeah, um, the whole score review thing. Yeah. Yes, yeah, it was just a bit a bit odd, a bit odd. Um, I would have maybe preferred Gold Coast to win by the point. But, <laughs> yeah, you know, that's all right. Yeah, never want never want Carlton to win. Mm. Um, but yeah, like it's like I don't know. I feel like the latter we're going to be looking at a lot of swings for the first half of this season because it feels like there's some really weird results happening, um, and teams are belting teams one week and then losing shockingly the next week. I mean, like, Richmond lost to West Coast last week, win this week. Yeah. Um, GWS smash Bulldogs last week, lose this week. It's, like, it's really up and down. It's good for the comp because, I mean... That <laughs> Brisbane as well. Brisbane smashed last week. Yeah. Great win this week. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, against Melbourne, too, wasn't it? Uh, e- Brisbane, yeah. B- yeah, beat, beat Melbourne. Melbourne by 18 yeah. points. Yeah, that's... And in Casey, that's really impressive. Um, but, yeah, that, that kind of topsy turvy nature week to week, it's just gonna make the competition more exciting. Like like we've seen through the men's competition this year. You've had yeah. from what third down to fourteenth or something yeah. all within a couple of games. And, and like a lot of movement, teams that are like yeah. right at the top and then dropping down. Yeah. And it's yeah. kind of like not been that in the women's comp for years. Like there's been a really settled mm-hmm. top four, five, six. Yeah. Um absolutely. so yeah. Looks like looks like it could be a really interesting season. Um just a, a note to everyone that Geordie will put, be putting up a link on the socials for hot takes on Sunday. Um, we got a taste for them last week and would really appreciate if you guys got on that after the game. Um, and that's about it for this week. Uh, everyone hopefully will get down to Windy Hill on Sunday. It'd be great if we could, yeah, get a big, big crowd in there. Uh, hopefully at least three and a half thousand would be, would yeah. be good. Yeah. I remember there were a lot of Saints fans uh, last year. So yeah. expecting... A decent travelling number. Yeah. yeah, Saints fans do tend to make their way over, which is which is good, and hopefully there'll be a yeah a, a good crowd. Mm. Um, hopefully for good weather, because God only knows what's going to happen if there's if the wind kicks up yeah. like the round one. Oh, God. Uh, but anyway, thanks everyone for listening. Um, if you want to uh, grab some merch, you can on the website and uh, subscribe on social media and to Discord. Thanks everyone. We'll catch you next week. Go the planes. Up the planes.